Thanks, Barry. Uh, good to be here, and thanks for asking me over. Um, I'll flick through a few slides and um, hopefully uh, give rise to some discussion on those. Uh, firstly, some context. Um, this is world electricity consumption from the World Energy Outlook document. You can see the green wedge there, which is Asia, which is where there's a huge demand growth. Electricity demand, if you have a CO2 limited scenario, and I'm sorry the two cartwheels are the same size, they shouldn't be, but you can see that the pattern changes and coal shrinks a lot, nuclear increases a bit and a few other things increase a bit. We've got to actually think of different ways of generating electricity and nowhere more so than Australia with about 85% of our electricity now from coal if we are serious about CO2 emissions. This is a picture of the world um, you know, fuel for electricity generation now. Um, you know, has this got a pointer on it? Right. Oh. Um, anyway, too bad. Uh, top, uh, three things to make from this. First is the green at the top. There is a lot of nuclear power being used at the moment around the world. Uh, and you can see uh, particularly OECD Europe, USA, and increasingly in China. Second point to make is the red areas. That is all coal at about one uh, kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. Uh, there is a lot of scope for painting some of that green. Uh, nowhere more so than in China, but also look at USA. Uh, that's little Australia over on the right, by the way, a narrow one. Um, and the third thing to point out here is the yellow, which is gas, which is increasingly unaffordable. Uh, if uh, once we get past this sort of peak of uh, shale gas, which is uh, depressing prices in the US at the moment or worldwide. Um, this is roughly where the world's nuclear power reactors are now. There's about 440 in operation at the moment, uh, 58 under construction, 150 firmly planned, and about 14% of the world of electricity. This is a picture both of the share in the line, which as Barry has pointed out, has de declined since uh, a few years ago, and the bars giving the actual amount. Um, this is uh, the WNA reference case in terms of what's coming up. Um, and uh, the main thing to comment on there is uh, really China and Asia over on the right, and also Russia. Very big um, increase due there. Europe shows a slight decrease, but this was before the policy changed in Germany. Um, so there's a fair bit in terms of net gigawatts uh, being available, uh, expected to be available in 2030. The main drivers worldwide for nuclear expansion are the basic economics, including fossil fuel prices in most countries, not in Australia. The prospect of carbon emission costs, yes, that applies to us. Insurance against future fuel price increases, and I'll explain that more in a minute because uh, the most of the cost of nuclear power is capital, not fuel. And energy security is a big issue. A great deal of the American defence budget is about energy security. Surprise, surprise. Um, and uh, the Western Europeans are very nervous about Mr Putin sort of turning off the gas to his Western neighbours. So those are the four big drivers worldwide. Only one of those really applies to Australia. Coal here is currently more competitive broadly speaking. Perhaps not in South Australia so much and of course not in Western Australia. But nuclear plants are getting relatively less expensive, that is relative to other te technology capital. Uh, the prospect of carbon emission costs raising coal-fired costs by at least $25 per megawatt hour, so that's two and a half cents per kilowatt hour or more. Fill in your own figure. This is an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, this is actually Victoria, but I, I use it as typical of any, um, any developed system. You can see there the amount of electricity uh, it supplied that is base load, that is basically 24-7. Continuous, reliable supply on a large scale is the descriptor for base load. Um, and, um, if, but the peak get, gets a fair bit above the base load level, uh, not quite double. And we'll come back to that graph in a minute. But that's terribly important to keep in mind when you're thinking of scenarios for supplying electricity into a system where this is the pattern of demand. Wind, of course, is low carbon. But, um, and this is from the Danish Wind Energy Association, each line is one day of one week. 
and the line of the top 650 megawatts is the capacity of the Western Denmark wind system. And uh, you can see there that it's not wildly impressive. Uh, and they've got also, uh, they've, and, and the, the whole intermittency thing in, in Denmark and in Germany, and Denmark's linked very closely to Sweden yeah. and Norway, is a big headache. I can elaborate on that later. But Western Denmark, in fact, works very well with wind because they have, a th and the 650 megawatts here, okay, they've got a 1,050 megawatt interconnector with Norway, and as soon as the wind drops in Denmark, will you turn on a tap in Norway? Norway is about 96% hydro. Brilliant synergy. And if you can get wind and hydro working together, it's terrific. Southeast Australia, here's one week of southeastern Australian all wind farms uh, in May this year. Draw your own conclusion, there's 830 megawatts there. Uh, nuclear power is also low carbon, virtually zero carbon in terms of the reactors. These are new ones in China, uh, previous one in the US. Case study in uh, France, and this is sort of being echoed a little bit today with uh, China. Um, oil crisis in 1973, they had a bit of nuclear power online then. They were just experimenting with it early days and they said well, this is the way we need to go because um, of the oil crisis and, Im need and France needs to import whatever energy it uses. So uh, you can see the growth from Fessenheim in 1977 up to 1999. That is their big program of building three types of standardised plants, or one, one type at a time. Uh, so they're now 78% nuclear roughly. Um, and uh, they have uh, the cheapest kilowatt hours in Europe pretty well, uh, and uh, 58 reactors in operation on 19 sites spread around France. Very good public acceptance of that, very reliable power, uh, no CO2 from it. Uh, US electricity production costs, be careful of any figures you see from the US, they always exclude capital, <coughs> as these do. Uh, but you can see there that actual operating and fuel costs are very low for nuclear, better than coal and, of course, gas and oil starting to go through the roof there. I'd just like to dwell, dwell for a minute on this, um, if I could. And um, I'll look, I think I'll do, uh, do it. Firstly, look at, look at the, the left-hand bar is uh, the spot price in 2003 in Finland. The three middle bars are the ones I want to address. First of all, look at the pink at the bottom you will see that nuclear power is very much more expensive, as Peter has said, to build than gas or coal. Very much more expensive. There is a severe capital hurdle to get over in building nuclear power. Once you've done that, you've got your operating costs in the blue, which are much the same for coal and nuclear. Then you've got the fuel costs in yellow, and that's where nuclear really wins. Um, and those fuel costs uh, are pretty perhaps a bit more stable than uh, coal or gas, but the point is they're very small. So even if they double, you haven't got a great headache, but try doubling the yellow in the gas one and see what you get. And then stuck on the top, you've got 20 euros per tonne CO2 cost in the bluey green. And uh, so that gives you a comparison between nuclear, gas and coal for Finland, and that is the basis on which they... Uh, entered into a contract to build Okiluoto 3 nuclear power reactor, 1650 megawatts, about 3 billion euros. Uh, that was the contract price. It's since gone higher, but that's Arriva's problem, not Finland's. And wind over on the right. <coughs> external costs are also significant, not just the, that's not the cost. The external costs are quantifiable, but not paid by the electricity consumers. They're paid by society at large in terms of health, environmental degradation and so forth. And you can see nuclear there in the middle, very low, as of course is wind and photovoltaic. But uh, get down to gas and coal and it's a different picture at the bottom. Uh, there's sometimes uh, some of the detractors of nuclear power say, oh, but what about all the energy you put into it? Do you get the same amount of energy out of it? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, you get a whole lot more out of it. Um, there are three, uh, there are four things I've put on this graph. Firstly, Vattenfall uh, has an audited life cycle analysis for its uh, Forsmark plant. Inputs there over, over 40 years uh, is 1.35% of the output. The figures I use a bit more conservatively are that inputs at 1.7% of output. 
uh, and I've got figures on the web for that. And uh, if you then extrapolate to very low grade ore, that's 0.01% uranium, where you've got to shift a lot more dirt and crush a lot more rock, uh, your, in your energy inputs go up considerably. Uh, you then, uh, your inputs are 2.9% of the output over 40 years. And there's negligible CO2. So there's just some numbers on that, and I can back those up if you wish. Um, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production, um, you have the picture there, the red are the direct emissions, uh, the twin bars indicate the range, and the white is the indirect. So nuclear is not zero. Sorry, this is double printed at the bottom, this always happens on a Windows system. Um, 20, uh, zero, there is some ZO2 from nuclear in the fuel cycle, uh, but it's minimal, as you can see compared with coal and gas on the left. Basically, every 26 tonnes of U308 from Olympic Dam or Beverly saves 1 million tonnes of CO2 emitted relative to coal. Or, so that's just a, a, a factoid for you. Carbon capture and storage, of course, is a big issue, especially for Australia, which is so coal dependent. Um, the IAEA, in the middle of this year, put out a new report say, saying that CCS was challenging. There's 26 billion committed in the last two years to CCS projects. There are 80 large scale integrated CCS projects underway, five of them operating. There are notable efforts and there is increased action, but rapid progress is now required if CCS is to be deployed by 2020. My comment is, um, don't be too skeptical, certainly don't be cynical, uh, but coal is too important a resource not to press ahead with CCS. Although it looks a bit of a vain hope, don't hold your breath for 2020 cost-effective realisation of it. The cost-effective is the key part. Another, another concern about uh, committing the world to much more nuclear power is the whole question of uranium resources. And this is a graph from 1975 to 2009 of world known uranium resources. Now I think I can assure you, if Ian Plymer's here, he'll certainly do so, uh, that the world, the earth has not increased in size twofold since 1975. Something else has changed. What's changed is knowledge. Um, and what has caused the knowledge to change, we'll have a look at the dotted line of exploration expenditure, and it tracks the figure remarkably well, I think. So as you put money into mineral exploration, as any geologist could tell you, you find more to a level of knowledge and certainty where you can publish figures uh, without, if you're a director of XYZ Exploration Company, going to prison or getting into bad books of the ASX. So that's what's say, and the more money you spend in mineral exploration, the more resources will be proven up to a level where numbers can be published. The, in other words, this is a graph about knowledge, not about geology. World uranium production and demand, this is another picture to keep in mind. A lot of production around the uh, 1960s and 70s for weapon stockpiles. And uh, so the green there is world uranium production. The black dotted line is the demand for nuclear power. The red dotted line is where I have added to that for what I calculate to be naval demand for driving ships. Um, so you've obviously got, have been, you know, since 1985, you've had a deficit. Uh, we've been running on um, stockpiles and so forth. And of course, half the nuclear electricity in the USA today comes from recycled Russian weapons. Uh, and that's hence the big arrow there. But of course, the gap's closing. The amount on the left of the black line is not finite, is uh, not infinite and um, we're going to have to mine some more. This is world sources of mined uranium in 2009. You can see Kazakhstan was the biggest supplier, followed by Canada, followed by Australia. But the point is, those green dots are spread fairly well around the, around the world. They're not all in the Middle East. Um, the open nuclear fuel cycle, or Siberia, I should add. Um, this is the way it works in the USA at the moment and in a number of other countries. Uh, you've got mining down on the left there and milling. You then export uh, the U308 to a conversion plant, which is preliminary to enrichment, which is a major process preparing fuel for most of the world's reactors. 
and about five sixths of your product from the mine gets parked as depleted uranium. There's about a million and a half tons of depleted uranium sitting in paddocks around the world at the moment. And then you get fuel fabrication into the reactor for three years and then storage and then eventual disposal after about 50 years. It's, it's, that's the open fuel cycle. But if you close it like that, <coughs> you get a lot more, you get about 30% more uh, energy out of your uranium than with the open cycle. For instance, France today gets 17% of its electricity from recycled uranium and plutonium. And you can see there the uranium goes back to the conversion plant. The plutonium goes straight up to a MOX fuel fabric fabrication plant, which draws upon depleted uranium. And uh, that sort of all makes things work better. Uranium conversion is just a chemical process with hydrofluoric acid. Uh, and uh, then you've got an enrichment process, uh, with, uh, which is a physical process with centrifuges mostly in the world today. And then you've got your fuel fabrication, which gives you a whole lot of pellets like that. Uh, and each pellet like that is equivalent to about a tonne of coal in round figures. And that's, this gives you an indication of the energy density, which is a major feature of nuclear power. And those pellets are then put in long tubes, which you call fuel, fuel rods. And the fuel rods are assembled into a fuel assembly like that. And that's a four metre long fuel assembly about to go into a pressurised water reactor. Um, yeah, and that stays there for about three years. Um, and uh, it's really, you've got over on the left there, you've got the actual core, which is uh, again about four metres high, um, in a very thick steel pressure vessel. That primary loop is kept as water, secondary loop is where you make the steam in this kind of reactor. And all of that is in about a 1.2 metre thick concrete containment structure, which was originally designed in the 60s because, you know, Nobody quite knew what had happened when things went wildly wrong in a nuclear reactor in the 1960s. We do know now. Uh, and that was in order to sort of contain the mess uh, if something went radically wrong. Of course, today it's, it gives peace of mind in relation to people driving aeroplanes into nuclear reactors. Um, so that's the picture and everything on the right is pretty much what you'd get in any Australian major power plant. Also a development of small and medium reactors. A, a, a lot of the reactors on the market today are large, and I'll come back to that, but there is increasing interest in small and medium ones for progressively constructed large plants so that you can take, put one unit on and get some cash flow from that and put another unit on and so forth. Really eases the capital burden for small grids, for isolated sites. Uh, for instance, e.g. Olympic Dam and the, um, and the um, desail plant for that perhaps. There are many innovative designs there. Many of them are fast reactors. A range of sizes from about 10 megawatts up to 300 megawatts, which is by definition small, and up to 700 megawatts, which these days is called medium. And there are diverse possible units. Uses, we'll come back, to, well, we're coming back to that now. Uh, apart from generating power, there's a lot of interest in nuclear process heat. For instance, South Africa gets about 40% of its of its fuel from uh, the fissure trough process. Um, and uh, if you have a nuclear source of hydrogen for that and nuclear process heat, you can actually get double the liquid hydrocarbons out of your coal and eliminate most CO2 emissions. Also, you can liberate oil from tar sands. Also, nuclear desalination. And if you're looking at reverse osmosis, then you can use electric pumps off peak in the, in the way that uh, Peter described uh, <coughs> and um, you can also uh, use, if it's distillation process, you can, uh, the scope for cogeneration of using the waste heat there. Uh, the Russians have a good fleet of nuclear ships, apart from the uh, nuclear submarines. Well, the Americans have a very large nuclear navy, of course. Um, this is powered by 270 megawatt thermal reactors, giving you 54 megawatts at the propellers, go through about three metres of ice. Quite a neat machine. But also, the other area of transport is uh, electromobility. <coughs> that is uh, plug-in electric hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles that plug in. And these can be charged off-peak, which then gives you a much increased proportion of your overall load as base load. So coming back to those earlier diagrams, if you charge a whole lot of electric vehicles off-peak, say about half your current fleet, uh, it would look something like that. Uh, which means, and given that your baseload production is a great deal cheaper per kilowatt hour than your intermediate and peak load, 
This has the potential of lowering the e electricity cost for everybody and giving you more or less free transport. So that's the way it then looks if you do that. And the base load gives you a much reduced uh, cost. Hydrogen economy. <coughs> this is getting a little bit blue sky, but we currently use about 50 million tonnes per year of hydrogen for oil production. In the future, projected about 1,000 million tonnes a year for use in fuel cells, maybe in cars. Now you get hydrogen by steam reforming natural gas. <coughs> you can then go to high temperature electrolysis of water or actually of steam. But the holy grail of this process is thermochemical production from water using nuclear heat, which needs about 900 degrees Celsius. The point about steam reforming from natural gas is that for every tonne of hydrogen you've got 11 tonnes of CO2, uh, which isn't a particularly smart way to make hydrogen if you think of electric vehicles as being low carbon. Uh, cumulative reactor years of operation. Um, there's now over 14,000 reactor years of civil operation and I'd suggest that that's a safety record unmatched by any major technology. People sometimes ask if the reactor design has improved since Chernobyl. Uh, well, the answer is yes, but actually it's the wrong question. The reactor design had improved a great deal before Chernobyl, and that's the reactor that should, that a reactor design that should never have been built. Three Mile Island, though, is a typical of a Western reactor uh, that was destroyed in an accident in 1979. Nobody got a radiation dose from that accident any greater than I got flying from Melbourne this afternoon. That's Chernobyl 4. Uh, and more people are killed every two days in the world's coal mines than died as a result of the Chernobyl accident. Again, factoid, but perspective. Perspective comes a lot into the nuclear debate, I find. Uh, most of the world's reactors today are Generation 2 reactors. The Brits still have a few Gen 1 ones going. Uh, but there are also a number of Generation 3 ones. The first of them are these two in Japan, came, into, came online about 1996. Um, and the main third generation reactors now being sold are these. The top one is being built in Finland, France and China. The second one is being built, four units are being built in China. The third one is uh, operating in Japan and being built in Japan, being built in Taiwan and about to be built in the US. The fourth one is being built in Russia, a state of the art. Uh, the fifth one is just, they've just sold four of them to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, the sixth one is about to be built in the States and, uh, and, in, and in Japan. Uh, the next two are a little bit in limbo, but just notice the bottom, now just notice all of those are very large, okay? Bottom one, Synergy HDRPM, uh, an order of magnitude smaller. And this is actually a high temperature pebble bed reactor uh, which they're about to start building in Shadown once they solve a couple of small political problems uh, in the Chinese system. Uh, but this has also been developed in South Africa, but that development is stalled now through lack of cash. This is the Finnish reactor in February this year, getting fairly well advanced. This is the latest French technology, which is a bit more complicated than this, which is the Westinghouse technology, and we've got another Windows compatibility problem there, I'm sorry. Uh, that's the Westinghouse AP1000. Um, and there's four of those being built in China and about another 25 are set to start construction. 25 of these large modern reactors. So the Chinese will have about half a dozen of them online, I think, before the first ones start operating in the US. This is uh, building the Sandmen 1. This is the, uh, one of these AP1, first of these AP1000 ones. You can get some idea of this. That's the biggest land-based crane in China and you can see the people there down behind the crane. Uh, it's uh, quite impressive, and this is modular construction. That is to say, you construct units of up to about, uh, items of about up to a thousand tons, and then hoist them into place like a big Meccano set. Fast breeder reactors are also on the horizon. I was talking to Barry about that before, and this is, uh, you can superimpose that on your previous diagram, but I don't think we've got time to talk about it. But there are about 300 reactor years of experience with fast neutron reactors. Many are and will be operated as breeders. Uh, the two big ones in China, uh, in Russia, uh, and two of those have been sold to China. Um, French ones, Japan ones, and many of the very small reactor designs are fast nuclear reactors. And this means they use fast neutrons unmoderated. Um, and they have a role in burning actinides from used light water reactor fuel. One of the issues with nuclear waste is the long-lived elements, which are not particularly radioactive, 
but they are very long-lived. Uh, and in that sense, they're a problem. And uh, they can all be burned in a fast reactor um, fairly effectively. This is the Monji reactor in Japan, which has just restarted after a long holiday due to a sodium leak. Um, and then after the Generation 3 reactors, you've got Generation 4 reactors. These are just on the drawing board. You can expect to see some in operation by 2030, but not too much before. The main thing to note in the second column is that most of them are fast reactors. In the third column, you'll notice all sorts of coolants other than water. Uh, and many of them are low pressure ones. One of the big, one of the hazards with the um, pressurized water reactor is that there's a huge pressures there with it. These will be mostly low pressure ones. And look, on the right-hand column, many different uses other than just electricity. So the nuclear future, it's a mature technology. It's been making electricity since 1956. It's increasingly competitive as fuel costs rise. There are environmental drivers, carbon emissions and clean air. Clean air is particularly important in China. I was there two weeks ago. A sunny day in Beijing. You can just sort of see that circle of the sun up there. Uh, energy security drivers are very, very important if you're sitting in North America or the EU. So part of the future supply more widely. The nuclear future for Australia, electricity demand set to double by 2050. Nuclear is 20 to 50 percent, according to the UMPNA report, uh, more expensive than coal. In, that's in 2006. They, did, they crunched the numbers. But there have been about 30% electricity price rises since then in many parts of Australia. So, uh, scenario, maybe 25 large nuclear reactors providing one third of the power by 2050. And incidentally, saving the equivalent of Melbourne's water supply. This may surprise you, but uh, it won't surprise you to know that you don't have to build a nuclear reactor on a coal field. <coughs> because you you're not thinking of... Uh, taking three to five million tonnes of coal to it each year. You can build them on the coast and therefore cool them with water. Therefore, you are not evaporating vast amounts of fresh water, uh, which you are at the moment in Australia. Carbon emission or CCS costs will greatly help competitiveness of nuclear and they seem to me to be an obvious part of future baseload supply in Australia. Thanks very much.